Hey there, it's Robert Baltadano. Welcome to another show of Talks from the Heart with Pastor David Rosales, and I'm hosting this program. And uh, it's always exciting to have you tuned in, or if you're watching on our YouTube channel, uh, welcome. And uh, we have a great topic for you today that we're going to be discussing. This time we're going to be talking about God in America. And Pastor David, again, welcome. It's good to be here. Yes, it is. It's always exciting to have these talks with you. It's it's a good thing because we tend we, we get to, to to really talk about things that do matter. I think so. I enjoy these kinds of conversations very much. So so today we're going to talk about God in America, and I know that's such a huge topic, but but before we really get into that specific uh, topic, I want to talk a little bit about uh, human history, uh, the, the history of mankind, and, and, and what God intended for, for people that he created on this earth. So if we go back to the creation of time, obviously passing through, uh, you know, the creation of Adam and Eve... Um, we realized that uh, something happened there in the garden that that caused the downfall of mankind. Sin came into the world, and from that point forward, man became rebellious against God. Now, here's the thing that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. God's intention was for a theocracy, correct? Yes. And what what does that mean? That means that God is ruling, that God was to be the center of all things, that man was commanded to uh, simply obey him because he's the king of the universe. And so God's intent was for man to live in fellowship with him, being blessed and provided for by him and all of that. But uh, man was not to be the ruler. He had dominion. He had been given authority in certain kinds of um, duties that he was to perform, but that was all to be under God's supervision in that God is the sovereign creator of the entire universe. And so God's intent, as it seems to be expressed in Scripture, was for man to be having a relationship with him and a relationship with the creation as the one who was the premier creation of God, vested with authority to enact upon the earth that that man was to inhabit. But because sin entered in through the deceptive purposes of Satan, and Eve took of that forbidden fruit, it gave to her husband, and he ate also. Sin was introduced at that point. And so man's relationship with God, which had at that time been unsullied by anything called sin, at that time man, because he sinned, broke fellowship with God, and that's where the whole redemption history begins. And so besides Cain and Abel and, and that whole situation there, uh, we see that when God created this world and, and the people on this world like us, obviously, um, we start to see the, the decay of, of, of mankind. And there's a verse that comes to my mind, and it's in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, when we really begin to see uh, the downfall of just society. And it says this, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man. He said it was great in the earth that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, that's interesting because... I don't know about you, but, but but it shows me from this verse that the issues that we have in our society today are not really political. They're more heart issues, don't you think? The issues of the heart, absolutely. Um, there's no doubt about it, because from the abundance of the heart, words spring and actions spring. You know, Jesus was speaking concerning that in the Gospel of Mark 7, and he said it's, it's not the outside that is polluted, it's the inside, because out of the heart proceed the wicked thoughts and the adulteries and the murders, etc. So it's always been a matter of nature, human nature. And so indeed, what, what it is, is we simply see the uh, visual expression of the internal condition. And so man being sinful in, in, in the fact that we have inherited the Adamic nature, the one that is prone to rebellion against God, then even the best that we can do as human beings is always going to be tainted by the self-interests and the things that proceed from a sin nature. And so it all begins from within the heart of man. Mm. And so after that, uh, we also see other things that are beginning to take place that took place in the beginning of time. And one is the uh, Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. Yes. I mean, now, now we're getting into something more serious. You know, God sees the heart of man is continually evil, but now the people that got created who were, you know, one language and all of that, now they're building this tower. Why is it that, that man has this, this, 
this desire to want to be above God, to to want to rule themselves. And in the Tower of Babel, if you want to talk a little bit about that, what what went on there? Well, human nature being what it is, is in constant rebellion against God. And thus, because we've been created to worship, we have a few options that we can exercise. We can we can truly worship the the God of the universe. We have that provided through redemption. We have that um, we are given opportunity to do that through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And today with the revelation of the word of God that instructs us how that can take place. And so we are prone to worship. Even atheists, those who profess there's no God, find something to worship, whether it's themselves or whether it's nature or whether it be some art form, some literature of some sort, whatever, they're going to find something to invest their attention and their adoration on. We simply are created in that way. We have been created with a sense of needing purpose. And even as the writer of Ecclesiastes points out, God has placed eternity in our heart. There's an awareness that that we have a time space continuum that we exist in. And we need to fill that up with something that satisfies or gives to us purpose. I mean, that's just a fact. And so we have the opportunity to have relationship with God because it reveals to us these things in Scripture. But man is going to find something to worship, something to do. And often when it's um, through man's invention, it's going to be the opposite of what God would intend. So when you see that the, the thoughts of man are only evil continually, they ultimately express themselves, those thoughts, in, in a form of worship. And so at that tower there in, uh, in Babel, they uh, intended to chart their own destiny or their, set their own course, not, not alone in the sense of they, them doing it from some intrinsic or something that came from simply within, but they look at the heavens. And as they looked at the heavens, uh, they began to try to chart their course or their their destiny through the natural revelation. Uh, J. Vernon McGee says that the Tower of Babylon was uh, possibly an altar of some form to worship the sun. You know, in in his perspective, there's some some credence to that. In that, the the sun separates the darkness by providing light, and so. He moved in that direction and said that, you know, there are others that would say that this Tower of Babel that was built was in order not to to reach into heaven in the sense of finding some way of going into the throne room of God, but in reality to um, to chart the astrological signs so that they could use the stars, the heavens, as their um, their directives, if you will. And, and it all goes back to Romans 1, where Paul says that they began to worship the creation rather than the creator. And so when man determines that they don't want to uh, subscribe to and yield to the directives of God, because we are intrinsically religious, we will find another form. And the Tower of Babel is that form where they said, let us. So they united in rebellious effort with one language and one purpose to reject the revelation of God and to chart their own course through, the, it appears at least, and I think this is correct, uh, through the um, utilization of nature as their, their form of directive, if you will. And so the Tower of Babel represents the rebellion of man, rejecting the sovereignty of God, the orders of God. Remember also that God had said, you are to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Yet they said, we need to remain together mm-hmm. here lest we be scattered. And so that was a complete rebellion and rejection of the ways of God based on the human nature that resists yielding to any authority. They united together in a single effort. And as a result of that, they began to look to the heavens to chart their own destinies, look into creation rather than the creator. And ultimately, ultimately God confuses their language. And, and this is something that they didn't do on their own. This was from that the leadership of Nimrod. This, the, you know, evil very often will find a captain. Yeah. You know, and so there is one who unifies purposes mm-hmm. and very often, you know, well, the scripture speaks right. concerning the unity. I mean, one, one of the, the powerful things that we find in there that, that we may want to address for just a moment sure. is that language is the great unifier. When you speak the same language, it mm-hmm. unifies you. And secondly, 
when you have an evil purpose, there are those who can communicate the evil purpose in mm -hmm. that language, which unites them in rebellion. And that's what took place with Nimrod. That's what took place with the unification of mm -hmm. humanity. And that's one of the reasons why God scattered them by dividing them according to languages and forced them to unite with those who they could communicate with and actually broke that problem down into smaller subsets. Mm -hmm. So going back to the whole theocracy, when well, we talked about this at the beginning, uh, God wanted one nation under God. And as you look at the history of the children of Israel, you know, it started as a theocracy, then it went to a monarchy, then an anarchy. And you look mm -hmm. in the book of Judges, so you see a progression, but, but it's more of a decline. Obviously, God wanted that theocracy. They, they kind of did not go with that, and then God gave them kings, and they even rejected their kings, and then it eventually became to every man did what was right in their own eyes, mm -hmm. which is a scary mm -hmm. thought. So the, the children of Israel were led by God in a very, very unique way. And when you read the scriptures in the Old Testament, I, 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 I'm, I'm always just, I guess, blown away with the way God did things among them, you know, manna from heaven and, you know, I led them in the, uh, in the daytime with the pillar of cloud of fire at night and, and all these wonderful things, God showing that I want to lead you. I want to, I want you to, to be fruitful. And yet the children of Israel became so rebellious. Why do you think they were so set against God's leadership? A man's nature is rebellion, authority. We are we have within us uh, a rebellious spirit that is is uh, is very often and most often revealed by a rejection of simple authority. I, I, I drive to to our offices, and um, in my neighborhood, there there are very few um, police officers that patrol. I mean, they just don't. They do show up, and it's you know they're just not there all the time. And so, I have a series of stop signs that I have to take before I get to a signal. And I tell you, um, nine out of ten, easily, nine out of ten people just drive right through it. I mean, it's not that they. Some of them just keep going forty-five miles an hour and just shoot right through it. There's no police officer around. There's nobody going to say anything. Or they'll just roll right through the stop sign constantly. You see that now. I'm thinking that there's going to be a day coming, and it's really not that far from now, where people are going to run red lights in the same way they're running stop mm -hmm. signs. Because it's more a matter of, like, I don't see anybody there. There were no cars there. So we are a rule unto ourselves. We're making laws unto ourselves. You know, we're saying this is okay for me because I looked at the situation. There was no car there that was pulling up. There are no vehicles around. Why should I stop? And that is that is so simple, but that is so real. I mean, it's just the scripture says that rebellion is tied up in the heart of a child. We rebel by nature. So if I say this is black, they say it's white. If I say this is sweet, they say it's sour. And Isaiah points that out. He says you have a tendency of rejecting because your sin nature is so polluted and you're so naturally rebellious. Even God himself is rejected. Even his word itself is called into question. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even his word is called into question by those who profess to know him. Mm. I mean, you know this, and I know this, that the higher critics from the 1800s, the Germans, especially who represented higher criticism, you know, one of the first things they did and they polluted the church with was calling into question the manuscripts of scripture, the authenticity of the word of God. They began to create multiple uh, authors for books like uh, like the book of Daniel divided as they did or the book of Isaiah in the way that they did by, by saying um, that uh, these really are not authentic manuscripts. These really are not God's word itself. Uh, this is really just uh, containing the Word of God, and all of that philosophy that has infiltrated and saturated the mentality of many scholars and many Bible colleges came with a simple rejection that came all the way from the garden mm -hmm. when Satan said, has God said? And even uh, recently I was sharing with our church, and I said, listen, if you can believe the first few words of the Bible in the beginning, God, you can believe the rest of Scripture. But if you want to reject just the first four words of the Scriptures, then you're going to reject the rest. You're going to find places there to reject. Look at the doctrine of resurrection, for example, the doctrine of resurrection that we find alluded to in Scripture. You see it in the oldest book of the Bible. You see it in the book of Job. You know, Job was written something like um, during the time of Abraham, mm -hmm. probably 600 years or so before Moses even penned the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. So the events that are related there, you see there in ja chapter 19, verse 25, 26 in mm -hmm. that area, 
of the book of Job that he says, I know my Redeemer lives. I will see him in this flesh. He's already alluding to resurrection. You see David the psalmist in about a thousand before Christ in, in Psalm 17, right around verse 15, alluding to the fact that he's going to experience resurrection. You see it in Daniel, mm-hmm. 605 years before Christ, chapter 12, verse 2. You know, those who sleep in the earth will be raised up. You see it alluded. And yet, by the time of Christ, you have the Sadducees Mm -hmm. who are saying there is no resurrection. And so we have seen those who profess to be believers, profess to believe the word of God. We have seen them fight against the word of God. What about the world, the world that says there is no God? Mm -hmm. And so rebellion within us is wrapped up from the earliest age. We sin because by nature we are sinners. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there are those who teach otherwise. Mormons, for example, say that we become sinners when we sin. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that I am intrinsically, because of my Adamic nature, in constant rebellion against God. And so, if God says this is the right way, travel in it, my flesh and my spirit, my rejection, plus the prompting of Satan, which creates an anti-God society called the world, this age that we live in, which is oppressively against Christ and doing everything it can to keep believers from following him, well, naturally, my, my rebellious spirit is going to respond to that which is his most like. Mm-hmm. And rather than dying to myself and saying, no, wait a minute, God's word says this, and it's not an easy path, but it's the right path. Instead of doing that, I simply flow along with the rest. And then so my, my rebellion and my rebellious spirit, my sinful nature, begins to present itself uh, in what it's natural for it to do. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm supposed to follow Scripture, walk in the power of the Spirit, die to my my inclinations and all. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why our society that we see, that's that's a core reason mm-hmm. of the society that we see is in constant rejection of the things of God. So when it comes to the rebellious heart, uh, especially as a nation, I mean, obviously that's nothing new to God. He's, he's obviously, I wouldn't say used to it, but, but it's nothing new. It doesn't shock him when a people rebel against him. And there's a verse in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 15 that I want to quote. It says this, Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. And, are, and he says, and are counted, or I'm sorry, and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. When you read that verse, I mean, it just shows you how God sees nations. They're, they're not, he's not intimidated by this. It's pretty interesting. God sees the universe that way. He holds it in his hand. I mean, yeah, the immensity of God and the littleness of man and creation mm-hmm. is quite a juxtaposition. And then Psalm two, chapter 2, you know, why do the nations rage? And, uh, you know, they want to, you know, obviously attack his Holy One and, and whatnot. And then it says that he laughs up in heaven, mm-hmm. you know, because we think as Christians that, you know, oh, God is so worried. He's pacing around his throne. He doesn't know what to do. And he's just up there saying... I can just do this, you know. Absolutely, <laughs> just smash them. It's like an ant shaking its one of its little <laughs> legs at you, threatening you. Right, right. Uh, there's another psalm that I want to quote. It's Psalm 47, 8. It says, "God reigns over the nations. God is seated on His throne." I think, as a Christian, and as we're coming into this topic, God in America, I hear a lot from Christians. They're very worried about what's going on in our nation. They're worried about what's taking place, you know, on the local levels to the higher levels. and But when you read verses like this, God is not worried. God is not nervous. I mean, he's mm-hmm. in control, right? Well, he'd have to be if he's God. Right. You know, he's sovereign and he is in control. I believe that God would say that uh, man has certain responsibilities and, and God obviously is sovereign over all. But we do have responsibilities mm-hmm. and we ought to exercise those responsibilities as citizens in the nation that we reside, mm-hmm. of course. But when it's all said and done, I mean, we read the Bible, which is his revelation to us, and he shows us the consummation of history. You know, we already know how it's going to conclude. Mm -hmm. So nothing's going to be changed. It's written in stone. This is what is going to happen. But until that moment comes, we do have personal responsibility for certain things. And when we look in the Bible, we see a lot of different powerful nations, empires, you know, Egypt, you know, you have uh, Babylon, Assyria. You have, uh, you know, even Rome. And where are they today? You know what I mean? I mean, absolutely. And they were huge. Absolutely. Big, big bullies, I guess, if you will. Yeah. And yet uh, we don't have Babylon. 
you know, we don't have that. Anymore. No, we don't have Babylon as it, as it was in its existence. We, we still, of course, from Babel to Babylon to mm -hmm. today, we have the spirit of Babel. Absolutely. The spirit of Babylon, of course. But no, those nations come and they go, you know, it, it, at, at my point in life, Robert, where I'm at now, you know, I've, I've lived through the lifetime of some men who, um, actually, uh, were very frightening and imposing people that um, at one time uh, caused other nations to have fear, you know, all the way from people like a Khrushchev, you know, or a, or a Mao or you name it, you know, the uh, recently demised uh, Hussein and others that, that were caused many people to fear, many people to, to actually tremble at the loss of their own lives and the tortures that they experienced, et cetera. These men are all dead. Mm -hmm because that's what happens they go the way of all flesh you know and so yeah there's there have been from ancient times to today societies that in their day were absolutely the masters of everything around them you know the the alexanders and the rest who were uh, awesome in their authority and power but as human beings they come and they go and only god remains yeah you know now, you're probably familiar with this. This is nothing new to you, but uh, I just found this uh, this statistic as we get into our topic, God in America. A third of Americans say the United States is a Christian nation, but more than half say the country has a special relationship with God. Is the United States a Christian nation? I don't know that there's ever such ever been such a thing. Um, I, I know what that means, of course. We, we do the underpinnings of this nation, Judeo-Christianity, the history of this nation um, dating to earlier dates, even from prior to the Puritans when the Spanish came into St. Augustine, Florida and, and all. And, and many of them came um, carrying the symbol of the cross. And so there has been a formation here in the United States from our earliest history of missionaries who've entered in, missionaries bringing a gospel you know, I, of course, have a tendency to lean towards the gospel that would have been brought by the Puritans, of course. But with that said, um, the United States is underpinnings. All of our laws and our, our cultural essence is really something that was built on uh, Christian theology. And so at one point, we were, um, we were considered to be a, a nation that was truly under the influence of Christian theology, churches practice, early leadership, many were professing Christians, devout Christians of their era, practicing the Christianity of their time and through their understanding of how it was to be lived out in their culture. There's no doubt about that. And so you look into even Supreme Court decisions where one in particular said, the United States is a Christian nation. Or you look at um, the motto. I mean, recently the American President Obama said um, something related to uh, our, our American motto being e pluribus unum. The American motto is not e pluribus unum. The American motto is in God we trust. That is the official motto of the United States. And sometimes we forget that. We, cause, we say, oh, no, it's uh, out of the many one. No, it's in God we trust. It's even in our dollar bills. It's in our paper money. You know, that is the motto of the United States. And so it's very deeply intrinsic within the culture of Americans. And even those who are not professing Christians have been affected by the Christian mentality. Um, you're standing in line. You're not a believer. You don't go to church. You don't even think about Christ other than at Christmas, and that's Christmas, right? right? You're standing in line. Somebody from another nation comes, you know, a visitor or perhaps somebody who's, who's here for whatever reason, and they step in front of you. They just step right in front of you because in their country, there are no lines. There are no lines. Mm -hmm. I've been in countries where there are no lines, and you, you get as close as you can to the person in front of you, or somebody's going to wedge themselves in there. So... You're standing in line, this person steps in front and cuts it. What do you feel? Well, you feel upset, but why do you feel upset? People don't analyze why. It's because I'm supposed to do unto others as I would have them do to me. Where'd that come from? You know, politeness. 
that that is very intrinsically Christian. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the way we think here, we just don't see that. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that until you step out of the United States and you go, you go to countries that have not been influenced to the depth that America has. Mm -hmm. So there are little things here, things that we will say are right and things that we say are wrong that are based on biblical doctrine. You look at all the laws, the laws that pertain to our society are found in biblical principles. That's why when some foreign theology enters in, that's why Americans will say, we're not bringing that in. No, we will never yield to Sharia law because mm -hmm. it is a different basis. It's a cultural different revelation than what we have in American law. That's where the cultural and religious battle really takes place. But Americans being unaware, I'd say, of some of those things, um, they, they have a knee jerk. They say, no, that's not right. But they really don't know why. Mm -hmm. And it's because we have had a blend of Christian, Jewish, Christian, Judeo-Christian theology that has been the underpinning since the foundation of this nation. So with, with the whole thought of, of being a Christian nation and all of that, uh, I mean, God in America is a topic I think is going to draw a lot of people to tune into this podcast because it's a big topic nowadays among Christians and non-Christians too. And so we may have somebody listening right now and they think they're Christians. Define what is a Christian? That's been a real difficult thing, hasn't it, Robert? Mm -hmm. I mean, because we're cultural Christians, you know, you take your surveys and George Barna and others will do their their surveys and they discover that 83% will profess to mm -hmm. be Christian. You watch TV and you see commentators quite often. I see it all the time. A commentator will say, well, I'm a Christian. Or you see somebody there wearing a cross and, mm -hmm. and that's a symbol of Christianity and all and um, every house in the United States, almost every house, has a Bible in it mm -hmm. because it's still the best-selling uh, book in, in our nation and all of that. So one of the problems that we are finding ourselves in today is the, um, the church, I believe, in general, has abandoned the the gospel message in our church buildings. I, and I, I say this as somebody who's been around for a while now and an observer and, and one who loves the church. So the comments that some may find offensive and all, you know, um, they're not, they're not, I'm not being clear or perhaps they're not listening the way that they, they perhaps should. The problem is, is we have become very similar, I believe, to even the day of Christ and even before that, in the history of the nation of Israel, where we are doing what Amos, in the book of Amos, and I'm studying through mm -hmm. it so it comes to mind, the book of Amos says, where God says, you are offering sacrifices to idols, and you're attempting to offer sacrifices to me simultaneously. And you're mixing your idolatrous worship with that which I have required, and in the mixing of the two, you have polluted it. So I don't recognize your, your songs and I don't recognize your offerings because they have been tainted with idolatry. And I believe that what the United States is doing right now is being tainted with methodologies and messages that are not of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, all of my walk with the Lord, I got saved in 1970, so I've been walking with the Lord for a while now. All of my walk with the Lord, I have seen the insidious effort of the enemy to infiltrate in those 40-some years that I've been following Christ by bringing messages that seem similar, but upon close scrutiny, you discover these messages are not really presenting Christ for who he is. These messages are not are not built on scripture so much as personal experience or supposed revelation. And the church has become weak because the church doesn't see that we're under attack. We are under attack. And we are that proverbial frog in the kettle where the water is beginning to slowly boil about us, but we're so busy trying to find pleasure in an unpleasurable world 
that we're failing to know that joy goes beyond pleasure and happiness. Mm -hmm. And that comes through a knowledge of the, of the true God. So here's your problem. I think one of the problems. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that the pulpits of America are not thundering the word of God with righteousness. Mm -hmm. That we're not really expecting the members of our church to really do what this says, but we are simply feeling that, well, we gave that message, hopefully they will. So there's no sense from many pulpits that this, this, this is God's word and we really need to do this because we're afraid that people won't come back, mm -hmm. that people will not give their offerings. And here we are left with buildings we have to pay for and staffs that we have to support mm -hmm. and projects that we've committed ourselves to. And thus, we at one time maybe we're teaching a, a better, more full counsel kind of message. We start softening it because we're afraid of losing the sensitive hearers and, and I believe what is happening right now in the United States is the gospel that actually was pre presented through its fullness by just studying through a Matthew, Mark, Luke, or a John or mm -hmm. whatever, it's not really being fully disclosed. Mm -hmm. And so the demands of discipleship, you know, pick up your cross, mm -hmm. follow me. Well, I'm not quite sure whether I could preach mm -hmm. something that harsh because Today needs to be the best day you've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Or God wants you to be completely healthy every moment. God wants to provide every dime and nickel that you need for everything and make you abundantly rich. And what we've done is we have taken the message of Job, and this is what I mean by that, which when Job was undergoing his severe trial, his friends were saying, there are two things wrong with you. One is uh, you've sinned against God because in sinning against God, you have lost your, your health. And secondly, in sinning against God and, and, and speaking foolishly, you have also lost your wealth. And so even in Job, his comforters were saying that it's sin that is causing you to not have health and not have wealth. And they were mis misinterpreting and miscommunicating God because God had a purpose and he'd already made his declaration. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is a righteous man, the most righteous on the face of the earth. And so you have that little story that's being lived out right now. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is, is turn on a television program and you'll hear some guy tell you, give me $65 million so I can buy a jet mm -hmm. airplane because I'm the only voice that God is using right. today. I've got to travel everywhere. And, uh, and you have these gullible sheep right. who think they're investing in the kingdom because they're not getting taught the word of God. Mm -hmm. And the individual who is saying that is profiting off of the people. I will not call into question his sincerity, but I do call into question the effect. And the effect is, I'm important, you're not. You can be important if you support this important mm -hmm. person, even though I'm not telling you the truth. I'm telling you what I think is true, but... I'm mishandling scripture. And so getting back to your original question, mm -hmm. there are numbers of people who think themselves Christian because they haven't heard the gospel and really in faith actually said, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. I am rancid in every way, shape, and form. The only thing I deserve is eternal damnation. But your grace has been provided to me and you've given me the opportunity to receive your message and I am a miserable, miserable person without you. I need you. Forgive me, a sinner. You don't hear that kind of message in every pulpit in America. You just don't. Mm -hmm. you, you know, remember there was a time when the, um, during the Revolutionary War that it was stated concerning the United States that the United States is a great nation because it's a good nation. Mm. And if it ever ceases being good, it will also cease being great. Mm -hmm. Well, we're at that point where we're ceasing being good. And those are the things that I want to talk to you here as we come to the to wrap up this this uh, topic tonight. But but I want to go back to what you said. So basically, the lack of gospel teaching is making the lines very fuzzy when it comes to the definition of Christianity Absolutely. or what it means to be a Christian, because Absolutely. the word itself means Christ-like. Christ follower. And, mm -hmm. and what you said is interesting because the Christianity you see in our nation today is a Christianity without discipleship, Christianity without the cross, Christianity without the incarnation. So 
when you remove those elements out of the Christian faith, then you do have this carnal Christianity Absolutely. or this Christianity where people are not really taking Jesus serious. And, you know, going back to what this nation was, I mean, the Bible was read. I mean, the Bible was used in the schools and um, it was from 19 or 1607 to 1962, over 300 years where the Bible was used. That, that's unheard of today, that if you walk in with the Bible at a school, but but one thing that uh, I also found is, uh, according to LifeWay, they conducted a survey of a thousand adults uh, a couple years ago, and their report uh, found that belief in America as a Christian is kind of fading, yes. is what they said. And I was thinking about how that's happening, even just recently, which it was overturned, or um, it was obviously it didn't go through. Is that SB eleven forty six, which it was sought to take away the exemption of religious schools to uh, anti-discrimination laws. So that means that, you know, if a college or even a church, you know, is teaching against these things, that transgender, whatever, you can get sued by that person. Well, that bill didn't go anywhere. So that was a, a victory, I guess, for us at the moment. But I think the problem that we're seeing here when it comes to the Christian faith is that Christianity is almost like fading little by little as we move forward with, with the different leaders that are coming on board with this nation, don't you think? I think that... Christians, um, by and large, are are being brainwashed by the spirit of this age to think that there's no hope. Yeah. When I got saved back in 1970, when you begin to look at the the uh, atmosphere of the United States, I mean, I I I got saved in in the generation of the 60s. I got saved in 1970, but. If you look at 1950, from when I was born to 1960, it was a very, a very idyllic time in the United States. We came off of uh, winning World War II, you know, and um, we saw housing booms and, you know, many things introduced into the United States that made us very prosperous. I grew up in that time. I grew up in a time when we didn't really need to take our car keys out of our cars. We mm -hmm. could leave the keys in the car at night. Nobody's going to steal it. You could leave your bikes out in the front in our neighborhood that we lived in, and somebody would actually take the bike and put it in the backyard for you, you know, just as a neighborly thing. I, I grew up in a very idyllic time where you could go to the a store down the street and get the Sunday paper for a quarter, and you would lift up the top paper, and you'd drop a quarter, and there'd be a pile of quarters there that others had left. And you take your paper. You didn't think of stealing those quarters. You just didn't do it. We lived in a different time. But then we started having some very bad times. We had the uh, uh, assassination of John F. Kennedy, the assassination of Martin Luther King the, Jr., the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. We saw riots in the street. We saw uh, the imposition of uh, the drug culture through music. We saw uh, a turmoil, uh, Vietnam War. And so when I was growing up, uh, I, growing up from the 50s where it was idyllic to the 60s that were tumultuous, you know, I mean, I was in Norwalk when the riots in Watts were taking place, and that was only a few miles from us, and people were thinking, oh, no, we're going to have riots in Norwalk. You had New York, Newark, New Jersey, Detroit, Chicago. You had uh, killings on college campuses like Kent State, takeovers of of president's offices like at Berkeley. I mean, it was a tumultuous time. And then who wants to go to Vietnam? Who wants to die? Who wants to go to war? And then Time Magazine is saying, God is dead. God is dead. You know, the Christian faith in the United States no longer exists. That's my time. That's when I grew up. And before you know it, you've got on the cover of Time, you know, the Jesus mm -hmm. Revolution, the Jesus Movement. So I really believe, Robert, that the times that we're living in are similar to the times that uh, I grew up in. And uh, when people were saying, there's no need for God, I believe God breaks out in those times. Mm. You know, A.W. Tozer, uh, one of my favorite thinkers, pointed out that, and he died in 63, A.W. Tozer pointed out that when times have gotten dark in our history, is when God has broken out in revival. Mm -hmm. He died in 63. 
within just a few years, the Jesus movement sprang mm -hmm. into existence. So mm -hmm. even at my age, at this moment where I'm at the twilight of my ministry and moving on to mm -hmm. something else, perhaps not that long in the future, Robert, um, I still believe that Jesus Christ has the ability to reach into somebody's heart because he's the only one through his powerful message and through his truth who can rescue the, uh, the downcast. The, he can heal the brokenhearted. He can provide comfort for the lonely. He can do all of that. And he can give us hope in a hopeless situation. Mm -hmm. And so right now the enemy is doing all he can to, to present his doctrine of hopelessness mm -hmm. and confusion. Mm -hmm. But that's when we need to stand up and be most bright. And the thing that concerns me is the church is getting lulled into this, thinking, oh, what's the point? Might mm -hmm. as well grab while I can. I mean, that's why some people will go out, and Robert, you know this, I'm not speaking out of turn when I say someone will go out on a Saturday night, drink, party, and then teach Sunday school mm -hmm. on Sunday morning. That happens. And sometimes after church, worship teams will be in local restaurants drinking their mm -hmm. beer. They just performed worship about the most high God, and they're down in their suds. Mm -hmm. We used to call it down in your suds. They're drinking <laughs> beers. I'm telling you, it's that it's that that is yeah. making the gospel look powerless to mm -hmm. save. That's what it is. So people like you and myself and others who are sincere, we look like we look like fanatics. Mm -hmm. We look like um, we're out of touch. We don't understand. No, we're simply genuine Christians, and in the darkness, the light will always be most bright. Hmm. It's interesting because I found this guy who said this, and I'm going to quote in what we're talking here. The Christian faith in America is on life support because far too many of us have simply stopped living like Jesus. Well, I don't know that it's on life support. I don't think that the that man ever supports the life right, of right, God, right? Of course. Right? But I, you know, wanting to use his flowery language mm -hmm. to represent the uh, fact that the church seems to be operating on three cylinders. From a ministerial perspective, I have to say that there are many tares mm -hmm. that have been sown among the wheat. Mm -hmm. And Jesus made it very clear. He said that that uh, that the the church would have so many tares that people that people will see them and the tear, I, the question I've asked is out of Matthew 13, I've asked is how, how do tares ever find it comfortable to be amongst the wheat? How's mm -hmm. that work? How, how can an enemy, Jesus said, sowed these seeds? How did the enemy infiltrate the church? How does a tear feel comfortable in a place that exalts Christ? And the answer is that place is not exalting Christ. Mm -hmm. That place became a place to accommodate sin. That place became a church in name only. Mm. And that's what's taking place. Mm. Because in a church that actually divides properly the Word of God and expects people to obey, live by it, be blessed by it, they will shrink. They will shrink because the challenge is such that people like that rich young ruler who find pleasure in the world and have great riches and want to have the expression of faith. You know, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? You know the law, you know the commandments. Jesus gives some social commands. Well, these things I've done since my youth up. What do I yet still lack? In other words, I'm doing all of these things, but there's an emptiness in my soul. Give me the real prescription. Sell all that you possess, give to the poor, come follow me. And what is the response? <laughs> he went away very grieved because mm -hmm. his riches were very great. Mm -hmm. And so that's America right now. It's a, yeah, I want to be religious. So that's mm -hmm. why we're calling ourselves as Americans spiritual, mm -hmm. but not Christian. Mm -hmm. and that's what they're saying. They're saying, well, I'm spiritual. I believe in a God or a higher power, some other out there, mm -hmm. but I'm not willing to commit myself to, to the Christ. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you willing to? Well, maybe the demands of being a Christian are beyond what I'm willing to yield to. Or maybe the Christians that I've met haven't yielded to those demands either. So it's it's powerless to save. You know, the hypocrisy of the church today, and this is no judgment on those whom I love. God knows mm -hmm. that. 
but the hypocrisy of the, the those who profess to know Christ today, the greedy materialism, the the um, propping up of of uh, religious figures as if they're Jesus Himself, the fawning and the the um, the desire for notoriety mm-hmm. and fame, the the young man having to dress so cool and so suave and so hip and have so much glitter going on. There's no true message of the gospel coming out. There's a, there's this, it, it seems in some of the places I could name, there seems to be places that, that are saying, look, it, it's not really going to be that demanding to pick up your cross. As a matter of fact, let's not even talk about picking up a cross. Let's talk about how this can be your best day today. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about how sad and broken and hurt you really are without any thought of how broken and grieved and, and all the man of sorrows was himself to rescue us from that condition. Mm -hmm. Listen, I I really believe, I really do, Robert, that, that Jesus Christ can take even the most horribly broken life and heal it. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. I've seen it. Mine wasn't as bad as others, but it was bad. Mm -hmm. And I have friends that were so messed up. And I Thank God that Pastor Chuck Smith and others like Chuck never watered down the message mm-hmm. and always pointed us to the one who could heal. Mm. And that's what the church needs today. Mm. I, I want to conclude with a few questions. And these questions are asked by a lot of Christians when it comes to the times that we're living in today. Uh, one is, how should Christians live in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of this confusion and stressful times? You live for Christ. I mean, the times that we're living in, again, Robert, a moment ago I was mentioning this, we think sometimes that these are the worst times that have ever been. Mm -hmm. Uh, The world has always been horrible, but when you look at uh, the time of the Christians in the early days of Rome, you know, the imprisonments, the beatings, the, the martyrdoms, you know, the the blood of martyrs was the seed of the church. You know, laws that were passed against the um, the message of the gospel, mm-hmm. even from religious leaders, forbidding the early apostles to speak anymore in the name of this Christ and stop blaming us for his death and mm-hmm. these things. We're not living in different uh, bad times. We're living, you know, bad times in the sense of being the worst times ever. Mm-hmm. You know. I can still walk out with my Bible right now and I can walk on the street and I can tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I can't do that in Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. I can't do that in Bangladesh. Right. There are a lot of places that 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 if I come out even with the cross that, that I'm pretty much saying, kill me yeah. right now. So Americans are so unaware. Yeah. You know, those oceans that surround our beautiful nation have still separated us from the actual... Mm-hmm you know, British Isles or the actual India, whatever. We're, we only see it on TV and thus we think we know because mm-hmm. we watched it. You know, we're Google experts. All mm-hmm. I need to do is Google whatever and I know mm-hmm. everything without ever experiencing it. But I'm telling you, I've been, I've traveled to many countries on the face of this planet. And I can tell you that I, I have, there have been times when I literally, literally, have wanted to kiss the ground that I was walking on when I got mm-hmm. home mm-hmm. because the freedom of Christ is still here. The church has got to wake up to that. Mm-hmm. We have to because the days are dark and the time is short, mm-hmm. but we have to wake up to those opportunities and mm-hmm. we still have them. Here's another question that I, I, I've received in the past is, has God given up on America? God doesn't give up. We give up on him, but mm. I, I don't I don't know that God, you know, I, I, I don't know. And forgive me, this may sound unpatriotic, but I don't know that God has a greater burden for America than he does for France mm-hmm. or that he has for Russia or China, for that True. matter. I, I don't know that God's an American. Mm-hmm. I think that God is the God of the whole earth. Mm. And so. You know, that almost begs the question, was there a divine purpose? Is there a divine destiny? Was the United States to be really that city on the hill? Is that what God intended to do? Mm -hmm. I think those are discussions worthy of consideration. But when it's all said and done, I'm an American. Mm -hmm. I'm an American veteran. I love my nation. 
You know, I served my nation. And if, if I were called, I would, I would probably still do whatever I have to do for this nation because I love it. I'm an American through and through. But I also know that God loves the whole world. Mm -hmm. My concern in ministry is to reach whom God has given to me. And if that takes us through the United States and into the world, so be it. That's mm -hmm. what it's supposed to be anyway. But do I think God has given up on America? I don't think God has given up on anybody. God so loved the world mm. that he desires them to come to faith in Christ. He's not willing that any should perish. Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult for me to, to say that America um, has a special place in the heart of God but I do know we have special privileges mm -hmm. that we ought to take advantage of. Amen. Here's another question that I've been asked myself, and I, 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 don't, I don't know. I've never done any extensive research, but is America in Bible prophecy? I have never seen that we are, which, okay. is, which is interesting because you do see nations by name mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, um, and there they are in Scripture, mm -hmm. and they're still in existence, maybe in a different form from when they were originally referred to. But I do not see uh, the United States in biblical prophecy. I, I personally don't. There are those who are much more versed in the subject than I mm -hmm. who can speak about, um, you know, the British Isles and their, mm -hmm. and the, and their, uh, their daughters, if mm -hmm. you will. And there are those that speak concerning the fact that we are actually a col colony of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and yeah. you've done it and yeah. I've done it. We've seen that. But would I stand up and with certainty say, yes, we are that? Mm -hmm. No. And and so the question obviously uh, follows then, how is it that the greatest nation on the face of the earth isn't in mm -hmm. Scripture? How is it that inconsequential nations in terms of geopolitics today, inconsequential nations are mentioned? Jordan, you know, Egypt, how are they mentioned? And here we are, the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, and we aren't mentioned. And there are usually a couple of um, answers that are given, and you've given these answers. Mm -hmm. I know you have, because they're the general answers. Is one is that the United States, one, could become so perverse, twisted, and lose our faith in Christ that we become a nation that is no longer great in the mm -hmm. very end and that we just become one of many nations and not the great nation that we we perceive ourselves to be today that's a potential or two that uh, a revival mm -hmm. springs out that is so amazing that millions become christians the rapture occurs mm -hmm. and and takes out the infrastructure, the moral infrastructure of this nation, and we're reduced mm. to an inconsequential people. And so those are a couple of the suggested answers mm -hmm. for that kind of question. And it's interesting because I think when it comes to Bible prophecy, I mean, the epicenter is Israel. It's, yes. it's that that area. I mean, if we're going to look at anything, we should keep our eyes in the Middle East. So I look at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yes. So we're, we're coming to the end here. And... In our nation, we're, we're actually up against some serious decisions, new president, and uh, we know the candidates without getting into all of this stuff with that. But a lot of Christians are kind of stuck. And here's the final question that I have for you and for those listening that I'm sure are probably asking, how do Christians vote? You know, we, we use the term vote with your conscience, mm -hmm. and I think that that term sometimes is hijacked. It, it could be a code way of saying, don't vote for this guy yeah. or that woman for that matter. But um, I believe that we have a responsibility, as I've shared in this church, and you've heard me say it before, that the right to vote was, was fought for and died for. This nation deserves citizens that value those officials that are representing us. Mm -hmm. And we need to go to the ballot box and we need to vote what most closely aligns to our biblical understanding. So when I look at candidates, I, I'm not voting for a pastor. I'm not voting for a religious leader. I'm voting for a political leader that represents the core values that I think are the most important to me. And so I compare the candidates and I think integrity 
and honesty, truthfulness, and things of that nature are extremely important when it comes to um, to ruling, because righteousness is supposed to exalt a nation. I know that in the Old Testament, the kings were to have the conduct of the king. They were supposed to live in a certain fashion, and the way the king, the Israeli king, was to lead was through the uh, word of God and with the theo theocracy that mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier, that he would use the laws of God as the foundations for all systems of justice in his kingdom. I believe that there is still a moral imperative that when I vote, I should vote somebody in, at least cast my vote in the direction of somebody entering in to that office of presidency, which is still to this day the most powerful office on the face of the earth, I should be voting for somebody who values the things that I see God values. Is that person uh, a person who is just? Is that mm -hmm. a person who is honest? Is that a person who has a, um, a morality about them? Is that a person who um, has a, a, a faith in God? I'd prefer somebody with a faith in God over somebody who has none. But is that faith in God, does it line up with what I understand Scripture to teach related to what faith in God is? Can I trust that person? Uh, I'm, I, I personally, speaking of the election that is coming up here in the United States and all, I have a difficult time um, with, with two, two candidates, you know, at this moment. And then if an independent should come in, mm -hmm. um, I'm certain that uh, that'll just be a third person I have mm -hmm. a little bit of a difficulty with. But as I look at it right now, um, I will be voting. I will be voting for the one that represents overall uh, what I believe is most closely aligned to the things that I value. Plus, I will be looking at track records. Uh, when I look at how somebody's life has been lived out in public, it gives me a good idea of what's going to take place in the future. Mm -hmm. And so as I look at the candidates right now, I'm not thrilled with either one of them. Mm -hmm. But I, I have already seen what happens when we try to make history by bringing in a candidate, as we did with Obama. You know, we're making history, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we made a good choice. Mm -hmm. And this other candidate, you now Hillary Clinton, is candidating on making history. Um, I think that uh, that's not sufficient. What I'm looking for is somebody that will answer that three o'clock phone call in the morning and actually mm -hmm. respond to it. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for somebody who is honest and forthright. My problem right now, and I think I'm probably speaking for others as I say this, is I have a known quantity in one person and an unknown quantity in the other. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me you know, more nervous is that I don't know what candidate Trump will do. He's just making promises. But on the other hand, I've seen what candidate Clinton did mm -hmm. and that didn't sell me at all. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's making it difficult, I think, for a lot of people. And I'm not somebody who is going to vote for just this candidate because I'm registered in this party. But at the same time, when I see the platform of a party that does not represent what I believe, I can't vote for that candidate. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I think many Americans are. Mm -hmm. We're not voting for a pastor and we're not voting for Messiah. Mm -hmm. What we're voting for is somebody who lines up most closely to what I think is very valuable. Mm -hmm. And that's how I vote. Well, it's been a very informative topic. God in America, Pastor David, it's always, uh, you know, a good thing to discuss these things that are relevant, and a lot of Christians are always looking for answers. Any final thoughts on our topic today? I, I think that we need to always remember that we have responsibility to do that which we have been given the privilege to do here in the United States. We can take advantage of the opportunities by presenting the gospel, living for Jesus, having church service, evangelizing the, uh, the lost, going on the radio, being in the print, and all of that to get this message out. I, I think that the church needs to wake up in these last days, and we need to be aware of the fact that there's a huge battle for the soul of mankind, and uh, it hasn't ceased. 
and none of us have been called to to um, go on any kind of retreat and just to give up on it. No, we're going to fight this battle uh, and fight that good fight till we can say what Paul said, you know, I have fought the good fight. I'm ready. And so I really think that what we need to do as the church is to suit up and stay in the battle. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about David Rosales, you can visit his website at calvaryccv.org. If you have any questions about today's podcast, feel free to send an email to talk at calvaryccv.org. Thanks for listening and have a great day.